launching on March 12th as the first humanities offering on the MIT Harvard edX online learning platform. This MOOC, or Massive Online Open Course, has already been translated into, already, into Korean and Chinese with the intended adjustments to a different language and culture. Umberto Eco proposes a powerful model for the future of communication among cultures and language groups, an alternative to the imperialism of it would be better if everyone spoke English. Eco imagines, and I quote, a community of peoples with an increased ability to receive the spirit, to taste or savor the aroma of different dialects. In the best of cases, differences of language will no longer be barriers to communication, but spaces where people can meet each other and speak together, each in his or her own tongue, understanding as best they can the speech of others. In this way, even those who never learn to speak another language fluently can still participate in its particular genius, catching a glimpse of the particular cultural universe that every individual expresses each time he or she speaks the language of his or her ancestors and his or her own tradition." Unquote. There are, of course, as the speaker has mentioned, thousands of languages that individuals can choose to learn alongside or rather than English as a second or third or fourth language. Alternatives should be encouraged in a world that wishes to retain its linguistic diversity rather than encouraging the kind of uh, globalization that leads to hom homogenization and the loss of the rich heritage of millennia. But please note that ECHO's model deserves serious consideration even in a world where English is privileged as a second language. Let us replace the notion of speaking English with the more realistic one of understanding some English and ideally understanding several languages, a goal more achievable than speaking. We can see ECHO's model operating in Canada an officially bilingual country where not every citizen, whether immigrant or born in this country, has mastered spoken English, even though many non-native speakers are able to understand it. Although it's in one's interest to work on one's English language skills if one lives in an anglophone region of the world, not everybody lives in a predominantly English environment, even in Canada. If you were lucky enough to be raised in this country and exposed to French in school, you may well understand when listening to an interlocutor willing to communicate in French slowly and clearly. Parlez couramment et d'une autre affaire. But imagine if you could take a refresher course focused on listening. Passive knowledge is the linguist term for this achievable goal. Instead of expecting everyone to speak English, let us promote basic understanding and abandon Anglophone arrogance in favor of cultural diversity and the right of each individual to assert her own identity. Thank you. to the Honorable Dr. Bowman, coming up as the first governing member. Well, as an American Anglophone, I can only say Kyra, or for those of, those of you who speak Latin, Wale, huh? or Awe, if you recognize me around. Now, um, Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Member for the Opposition has raised some useful and interesting points, none of which are actually relevant to our argument, but I will deal with them each in turn. <laughs> Do the government members think that English is superior to other languages? Not at all, but we think that it is convenient and useful for some purposes, and that is what we are arguing. Um, what here's why we think it's useful. Lots of people already speak some English. It would be extremely useful for everybody to be able to speak to each other in some language that they share enough of to be getting on with. We have not for a second suggested that everyone should speak only English or that everyone should speak English as their first language. Let it be their fourth language. Let it be their eighth. But it is very useful, and surely this is so transparently obvious I don't need to argue it, that 
it would be very handy if there was a language that we could all talk to, talk to each other in for negotiation, for commerce, for avoiding wars, and for selling each other's stuff. <laughs> and indeed, that is what English is primarily used for. English is far from the most elegant of languages. It is far from the neatest or the prettiest. It is certainly not, okay, oh, it is certainly, as Dr. Carlin pointed out, a scavenger language. It is very happy to adopt vocabulary, idioms, and modes of speech from any other language it encounters. It is a greedy language. It is happy to take them all. It has a massive vocabulary. This is one of the reasons that English is such a great language for people to talk to each other in when they have no common language, when they have no other common language. This does not point to the weakness of English. It may point to the ugliness of English, but it also points to its raw utility. English is not proud. English is happy to get the job done. <laughs> now, uh, Dr. Carlin raises the extremely good point, well, why English? Let's accept, for the sake of argument, that lingua franca is a good idea. I think that lingua franca, that is, a language that, among other languages, we can all have in common so that we can talk to each other when we need to about those things that we need to talk to each other about. Why English? Not nearly as many people speak English as they can speak Mandarin. Well, that is true. If you count the secondary speakers of English, however, about twice as many people have English as a second language as have Mandarin as a second language. And I am not a linguist. I'm not a linguistics professor. I have a theory about why this would be, and I'll get to it in a minute. But here is one reason. Only 67% of people who speak English, two-thirds of English speakers, live in English-speaking countries. 99% of Mandarin speakers live in China. This is, there are, I think, two reasons. The main one is the English decided they wanted an empire. So they spread English all over the globe. And this is true, not just of English, but of every language that has ever been used as a trading language as a lingua franca. English followed the British army. French followed the French colonial powers. Latin followed Julius Caesar and his successors and turned into all the Romance languages. Greek followed in the trail of Alexander right around to uh, right around the Eastern Mediterranean. There is no lingua franca to date that has not begun in fire, terror, blood, and the pointy end of a sword. That is how languages, trading languages, tend to originally get spread. But once you've got it, yes, it has ugly, dirty colonial roots. But once you've got it, it's a useful tool. You may as well use it. I am not suggesting for a second that English will always be the most useful lingua franca, though there are some reasons that I think it is better than others. The fact that it is willing to adopt vocabulary, the fact that it is not pure, it is not proud, and the fact that while it is as difficult as any language to learn to speak well, it's surprisingly easy to learn to speak English well enough to get along. There are two reasons for this. It isn't pitch accented, that is, the pitch at which you speak a syllable doesn't affect its meaning. And it isn't very inflected. And if I look at my student papers, it's getting steadily less of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, grammatically, it is fairly easy to make yourself understood with only a few lessons in English. So, do I think passive language is a good thing? Absolutely. Uh, passive learning is a good thing? Absolutely. We should all understand as many languages as our heads can contain. Should we all be able to speak one for such purposes as we need? Yes, we should, because that will increase human peace and global understanding. How can anybody argue against that? Also, <laughs> apple pie, motherhood, and so <laughs> Assumption about the proper way of addressing a person in power 
and the proper language of addressing this person, and the proper setting for such an address, and for resolving any theoretical disputes. As well as about the resplendent robes we are expected to wear for such an occasion. <laughs> I say, bourgeois democracy, comrade moderator. <laughs> And what is behind this bourgeois democracy is middle class values at their worst. <laughs> the assumptions we do not even have to voice about us not having to learn other languages, but in being able to travel, to purchase, to enjoy without an effort. But I say, citizen moderator, <laughs> that you, the bourgeois audiences of today, are depriving yourself of a pleasure, a pleasure still available to you if you hurry up, a pleasure of getting lost in a foreign country with a workbook and trying to figure out how to say this or that in the language, a pleasure of not understanding and becoming aware of this as part of your life. A humbling experience, to be sure, but the experience through which speakers of English as a second language go every day. The experience you would like to deny yourself. Why? You, in pursuit of entertainment, I say. <laughs> the highest value of your society. <laughs> Why would you? Indeed, request that the rest of the world adopts English, when you can, in fact, enjoy yourself even more while traveling and consuming and at the same time picking up other languages. This is not our ideology, though, comrade instructor. <laughs> <laughs> My party has a different view on what communication should be. Our ideal, comrades, is for people to understand each other and for any language policy enforced by the state itself, a crucial institution, to violence, for any policy to improve the lives of these people. I say, moreover, that it is not up to us living in an affluent North American society to even debate the question, which will be resolved by history which will be resolved, perhaps in our lifetimes, in a way we cannot even imagine. And the arrogance of our bourgeois values is even in the question itself, which is not up to us to discuss. But I say further that the revolution is coming. <laughs> it is on the way. And I speak here to people beyond the walls of this window, this bourgeois party. <laughs> on purpose. That the masses of us are arising, beginning with your own students who refuse to follow the rules of your bourgeois formality, inspiring in the refusal to accept three explanation signs, which are so appropriate in the revolutionary language. <laughs> <laughs> this rebellion is on the way, and the English that you want to impose on the rest of the world while remaining, remaining speakers of this language alone, this English will be overthrown. The rebellion begins with your student, began, it be, continues with the English of the sweatshops, and then a new wave is coming, the wave which I'm not going to reveal to you. <laughs> but you will be overcome by it. Because, because 